Welcome everybody and thank you for signing on to today's lunch and learn session. We have a very special session today. Uh, this is uh, a, an uh, event that is being held by the Equal Opportunities and Career Development Office, uh, as well as the Women in Science and Healthcare uh, from NU NUHS. Today we are very privileged to have several of our HODs um, to have a panel discussion about building a great and inclusive place to work. Uh, and so, uh, you know, I, I don't want to take too much time for this, so I'm going to turn it over to my uh, co-facilitator here, Melina, to introduce our first speaker. Thank you, Swain. Up first will be Prof Ashok Venkataraman. He is the director of the Cancer Science Institute of Singapore, distinguished professor of medicine, NUS Yong Lulin School of Medicine, and the director of the NUS Center for Cancer Research. Um, Prof. Benkitram will be speaking to us about cultural norms and our responsibilities, each of us, to try and effect some changes. Over to you, Prof. Uh, thank you very much, um, Melina and uh, Swain um, and Rachel for having me on this lunchtime meeting. Um, I'm very pleased to be here and speaking as someone who has moved rather recently to NUS, uh, I'm really happy that inclusivity and diversity are receiving greater importance in the university's agenda. Uh, that said, I can also see that there is still much to be done. And so I hope that this lunchtime meeting and forthcoming meetings organized by your group will reflect step-by-step -step progress towards this very important goal of achieving an agenda for change. So Melina, as you said, I want for a few moments to reflect on that phrase, agenda for change. Again, as a newcomer in this complex environment of a major university like NUS, I can see how daunting it can be to conceive how we might all work together to change a culture. And I think we have to acknowledge that perhaps this culture is one in which inclusivity and diversity issues have not been given the importance they deserve in the past. It's a culture in which um, many people are still yet to recognize inclusivity and diversity as an issue. And it's a culture in which perhaps the reason to change is not universally accepted by everyone. So it is all quite daunting to conceive of an agenda for change. So in that context, I wanted to make a couple of points, which is how can we as individuals influence this agenda for change? And how can people like myself in positions of influence, such as being heads of department, um, can actually also propel this agenda for change. I think the thought that I want to introduce is the conception that we're working both with relationships as well as with norms. By that I mean we are operating in a culture with, in which certain ideas or certain ways of working are normative. These are the norms of our culture. At the same time, within that culture, we are all working um, through relationships that we have with one or more people. And I think that's an important issue to grasp, that change can start at the level of individuals, each of us in the relationships that we have, in the relationships through which we undertake our jobs for the university can be agents for change. But at the same time, relationships alone will not be sufficient to affect the norms. And in the end, durable change has to go beyond relationships to actually affect and change norms. I think that is where people such as myself, um, as heads of department, have a very important role to play in changing norms. So what have I been doing perhaps um, I can share with you at the Cancer Science Institute in particular and in my other responsibilities at NUS as well as at ASTAR. 
So already in the few short months since I took over, we have tried in the CSI to emphasize inclusivity and diversity by changing our governance structures to make sure that single individuals are not taking decisions, but instead that our governance structures begin to include um, people who are younger, people who are more diverse, who represent different points of view in our executive committees and in the committees that actually enact the business of our institute. We're trying to implement a culture in which there is far greater transparency in making decisions in which every single faculty member is consulted and has a chance to express their view, not simply told, look, this is what we're doing. In other words, transparency to the extent possible in making decisions. And at the same time, transparency to the extent possible in implementing decisions. How do we go forward with the decisions that we've reached? How do they affect different people within the Institute from our staff and students to the people who work there as well as our faculty? And last but not least, emphasizing the importance not only of consultation as I've outlined, but also of clarity of communication. Communication both with people within our Institute as well as clarity of communication, opening lines for people to communicate with the leadership. It's a two-way street. So I hope that this uh, brief uh, spiel from me um, explains both what I hope we can influence and how in the Cancer Science Institute, uh, we are trying to implement some of this agenda for change. Thank you. Thank you, Prof Ashok. For this introduction we're definitely going to get into some of these these kind of meaty issues in more depth uh later uh later in the webinar so but before we get to that so what we're going to do here is uh sort of continue with uh individual introductions uh for each of our panel members and then we'll have um we'll have a, a sort of fireside kind of group panel discussion for the rest of the time and during that time if you do have questions please Feel free to put your questions in the chat and we'll try to save a few minutes at the end where we can address some audience questions or address some audience issues. Okay, but now I'd like to turn to uh, our second HOD, who is Prof Vasala, who's the head of the Department of Medicine, and she's also co-director of the National University Center for Organ Transplantation. Prof Vasala? Hi, Swain. Um, thank you, Ashok, for that introduction. Um, I'm going to introduce myself in a very brief uh, few words. I'm the head of medicine of the National University of Singapore and NUH Department of Medicine. At, and it's really a privilege to be a part of this uh, symposium. Now, firstly, let me start off by saying that um, as a head of medicine, one of the largest departments or in, in NUH and in NUS, I suppose, for a young Lillian school. Uh, I'm privileged to work with a large group of excellent women leaders. Um, most, I mean, at least half the heads of divisions in my department are actually women. And I'm quite privileged to work with a very vibrant and very inclusive uh, de department which has diversity in age, okay, the youngest as well as the oldest, many uh, wide spectrum. But having said that, I thought I would share a few thoughts on my perspectives as a head. Now, um, I think I want to be grounded on what I say. I think it is indeed true that nearly 50% of our new joinees are women. But as we start looking at how they progress up into the leadership, uh, not, every, not a, the same percentage are, for example, academic in the sense that many of them have not applied for associate professor status or beyond. So in terms of progression, they may progress along the clinical progression ladder, but in terms of academic progression, many of the women pull back. Now, of course, when we look at various reasons why they're pulling back to thrust themselves into more leadership in academia, we need to think what kind of a role model are we, are we putting in front of them. Often when I come to a, a WISH symposium or a Women in Transplantation symposium or Women in Nephrology symposium, I hear about women, you know, who climb Mount Everest, 
who carry their kids on their back while they're doing multitasking, they do jogging, they do the marathon. They are super women. So I think, uh, is this the prime example of who we want to be as role models for the women? Do we wanna talk about ordinary women who perform extraordinary feats by multitasking? Let's remember who women are. Women, we have individual aspirations. For example, I uh, personally would like to cook better than I am. I'd like to finish that cro crochet I started 20 years ago. I'd like to finish that painting I started a couple of months ago or a couple of years ago. But all of that may fall back because I have other aspirations. As a, as a researcher, I would like to have a star award. Yes, that's for, uh, for aspiration of my own progression. Uh, but on the other hand, we're daughters. We may have elderly parents to take care of. We have, we are wives, we are mothers, and we're housekeepers. So when we juggle these multiple tasks, I often wonder whether it, we, how did we get here? I got here because I had a whole village to support me, starting from my husband, my parents, my parents-in-law, and even my two children. You know, at the age of six, my older son would bake pasta for, for the younger one or give him his nebulizer. So we had a whole village to help us along to manage our multiple tasks. But does everyone have that whole village supporting them? Not everybody does. So I think we need to talk about when we role model the ordinary person, the ordinary woman who doesn't have the whole village backing her up. Perhaps how does she do it? How does that individual woman who may have only the husband backing her up? Or how do we train our sons in making sure that they're party to this? You know, um, as a how do we train our families or how do we bring our husbands along or how do we bring our parents along on our journey as we progress? How do we seek support from that secretary you treasure so much? So, so I think as we role model the inclusivity, I think we need to role model multiple individuals along our journey. We need to role model the ordinary person who, who gains uh, leadership because I think we need to appreciate not every one of us have that village backing us up. Not everyone has a husband who changes the nappy at night. Have we, um, have we role model to work with our secretaries to support us to the best of our ability? So I think role modeling and, and how we mentor each and every person along our journey is very, very crucial. And I think that as I seek to ensure that every woman or everyone who attains their aspirations I think we need to role model differently for each of our people who work with us. And it is only by individualizing our approach to each woman, then only I think we can ascend this, this ladder of inclusivity and equity for everyone that we work with. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Atsala. Um, and reminding us also of the villagers that help us, that would not be unique to women. I think men too have their own village that help them. Uh, and uh, that would be a good transition to um, Prof Reshma Tanisha's talk about um, all the things she wants to do about um, mentoring, I suppose, and uh, also the role modeling that you mentioned earlier on, Prof Atsala. Um, Prof Reshma Tanija is Head of Department of Physiology at the NUS Yonglulin School of Medicine. Um, over to you, Prof. Thank you very much, uh, Melina, Swain, and Rachel for the invitation to be on this panel. It's really a privilege to share time with all of you today. I have been HOD almost for a year now, and I was acting head for almost a year prior to that. So it's the experience in the past two years or so that I speak from. And I have to say that I'm extremely heartened and happy to see the changes that we're experiencing in the school, in NUS and in Singapore to address inclusion and gender equality. I feel that these carry seeds for a new beginning. 
my experience as an HOD and the way I see um, the role of an HOD is essentially that of an enabler, someone who can accelerate the growth of their staff. And in the past two years in trying to build an inclusive environment, I've reflected upon each person, what is important for that person or member of my department? What career stage is the person at? What does he or she need? And so spending time to build relationships to recognize what the person's needs are has been important in tailoring and personalizing the attention and support they need for every individual. And just to give you an example, for instance, um, since I'm going to be talking mostly about careers and mentoring and personalizing them for individuals, junior faculty benefit by mentoring. And I think it's very important to work with them to build this emotional and mental resilience in the early stages. However, mentoring has to change over time and evolve as the person progresses in the career. So that tailoring has to be done dependent on the stage the person is at. Mid-career faculty, for instance, are very hungry for opportunities for leadership roles, appointments in key committees, service at higher levels, and using networks that we have to enable that has been important. With senior staff, and I have several very senior faculty in my department, uh, the needs are completely different. It's post-retirement opportunities and possibilities for them, whether it's as a mentor, a coach, a teacher, uh, any other options that they might want to consider. So the support I think has to be personalized based on the needs of the staff member. And I think then the HOD can consciously and very intentionally lend support to their staff so that they give recognition and opportunities to them as and when it's needed. So in other words, it's mostly having a very individual development plan or a personalized approach to ensure that the faculty are happy, successful. And while I'm speaking to faculty at this point, this is also true for non-academic staff to understand them and understand what their aspirations are and to help them with their career progressions, training opportunities, gaining competencies, for instance. So those are thoughts that I had, which I would like to share in further detail later, but this is where I'll stop now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Prof Reshma. Um, you know, really, uh, as we've already seen, like these different perspectives of what the HOD job is and, and how the HOD is seeing this, this is really why we are really excited about today's program to have uh, these different leaders uh, in, the, in the departments at, um, at NUHS. Uh, to share their their perspectives and hopefully uh, build a, a stronger community that can move forward on some of these issues. So I'm going to turn now to Associate Professor Paul McCary, who is the Director of the Life Sciences Institute and also Director of the CREATE Inflammation Program. Prof. Paul? Thank you very much, Sven. Um, so what, what I'd like to introduce today um, is the subject of hierarchy, which at least on the surface doesn't appear to be something that you can link um, very directly to um, issues of, of um, gender equality. Um, but I, I think this potentially gets to the nub of some of the issues um, that, that, that we're dealing with. Um, so what this relates to are the, the types of leadership structures that um, essentially you establish to run your organization. And it doesn't matter if it's a university or a company. For the most part, leadership structures um, tend to reflect the societies and cultures in which the organization or inst institution is embedded. And, and the reason this is important in the Singaporean context um, is because Singaporean society and culture is by nature quite hierarchical. And um, this, is, this is not a negative. Um, this is, is largely founded um, on, on very good Confucian principles. Um, that, that kind of emphasize the importance of healthy human interactions and th through promoting the idea that, that in general relationships between people should be unequal almost by nature, um, where individuals um, um, have a defined kind of hierarchical role. And the examples that are often given are things like, you know, father, son, mother, daughter, ruler, subject, and of course, controversially, um, husband, wife. And, and, 
And, and these are all values that, that are um, promoted quite actively in Singapore in society and culture. Now, the reason this is important is because basically, if you look at the managerial and leadership structures and organizations like NUS, they do in some, in, in, in some way reflect um, what's going on in wider Singaporean society. And, and what this means in practice is that we, we do tend to have um, quite a rigid and vertical leadership structure um, where a, an awful lot of decision-making and power is held by a relatively small um, number of individuals. And, and this is important for gender equality because this type of leadership structure tends to promote and favor um, leadership competences that would often be defined as masculine. So what I mean by that are things like strength and tough decision-making um, assertiveness, right? Now, if um, in contrast, you look at leadership structures that have a, a more horizontal, um, more democratic structure, these tend to promote and favor um, leadership competences that are often defined as more feminine. So these are things like empathy, um, humility, and most importantly of all, teamwork. And, and what I'm going to propose is that as HODs, as institutional leaders, even as individuals just running small laboratories, think carefully about how you've structured the leadership of the entity that you're responsible for. Think about how you make it a little bit more democratic, how you, how you make sure that everyone's got a voice. And, and if you can essentially establish structures like this, you are creating the conditions where female leaders um, will be recognized for the, for the competences that they have. And this is, th th this is something that we, we, we can all do to potentially create a conducive environment where, where more female leaders are, are gonna come through. Thank you very much, Prof Paul. Um, this ties back essentially to what Prof Ashok was saying in the beginning about cultural norms, um, the prevalent ones, um, and again, neither good nor bad, but what do we want to do moving forward so that we can work together better? Um, one starting point, if I may, is um, I'm very uncomfortable if people refer to me as Prof Ashok. I, I'm just not used to it. Everybody just calls me Ashok, so maybe that's a good place to start right away in this lunch thing. All right, Ashok. Um, so maybe the segue would be to Doris now, without the prof in front of her name, will ditch all the titles. Um, <laughs> besides being a good friend, uh, Doris is head of the Department of Family Medicine at NUHS and the Division of Family Medicine, um, uh, teaching and mentoring her students and her staff at the Yongluin School of Medicine. She's going to talk about the interesting perspective of the HOD's role in a sandwich role. Um, over to you, Doris. Thank you. Um, thank you for inviting me again to be a panel member. I have seem to be a sort of regular member of this com committee. This is my third appearance um, before everybody got sick of me. Um, I, I, I think the, being a last speaker uh, is actually a very interesting to hear all my colleagues what they thought. So I want to share just a little bit about why I think the head of department role is a sandwich role, is the meat in the sandwich. I have taken many roles in my previous uh, organizations at University of Melbourne. And I realized having been um, a lecturer, senior lecturer, associate professor, then you climb up the academic ladder, then I made it past the department, head of department, I thought, voila, I'm going to be vice dean, I'm going to be, you know, in the top echelon, uh, and then uh, I can tell people what to do, I've got a budget, uh, I have no one to do TPM, performance appraisal, I, I just took on this masculine role um, that now I'm the boss. Well, I came to Singapore, and I am now head of a department, as the smallest department compared to um, the Sala, huge department. So we are a division of family medicine and a department of family medicine in NUHS 
The same which is because when you think of a head of department job, you know, it is the most difficult part of the senior leadership. It's because you have all the responsibilities. You've got to manage up. You've got the dean, you've got the head of department bigger than you. You have uh, the university, you have um, provost president. Then you also, the other sandwich layer is that you have to operationalize the policies, the principles into your team. And therefore you have to manage down. And as you all said, they are very diverse. The team members that is part of our department, they all have different aspirations. They all have different, uh, perform the way they perform, the way they do things are different. You want to be, give them flexibility, but how flexible can it be? You still have to have all these layers of reporting, reporting, reporting. Every year I dread the TPM, I dread the uh, performance appraisal process because it is such a, uh, a model uh, that I perhaps never encountered is, is, is to reward the monitoring uh, for their role. And so you have to meet in the sandwich. You've got to know what the whole big organization is going. You are driver of a bus. You've got a destination. You bring these people on the bus. Some of them you employed. Some of them you inherit. And we're going to go in the same direction. And my direction has to be translated as a head of department of what the medical school, what the dean wants, what do we do for NUS. And then I thought, how am I going to translate all that strategic direction into a team of family medicine, of which they are all different. And it's so important that I can translate that so that um, I shine because my team shine. I, I have to sometimes be bold. I've, I've got a challenge that some of these policies doesn't apply to family medicine. And, and I just got to protect my, my staff and, and I cannot sacrifice them, you know? And so to be, to be the sandwich is that I hope sometimes it's not a piece of the bread that big, that thick, and the meat is very thin. I, I want to have a different sandwich that the top layer is thin, the bottom layer is probably big, but my meat in the middle is going to be boutique, flexible, diverse, but yet firm. Because if the head of department is just become too friendly, it's also problematic. There is favoritism. Now, I think I love Paul's comment about hierarchy, about female leadership is different. Sometimes we all want to be loved and it's quite a different kind of leadership. And, and the fairness is very important. And the word I want to finish off is a head has to be influential. We've got to make it, we have to soften the blow of the policy, the budget cut, all these things. And we have to soften the blow and we're gonna influence our staff so that they will come along with us. And I think also at the end of the day, the role model also you talk about is different. And I really do value um, the, the way different models, uh, role model works, and yet you yourself cannot change the way you are. And you cannot be somebody you are not in your personality. So I just stop here by saying, yes, the boss is not up there and your subjects are there. Your boss has to come down together with all your other staff and you have to get your hands dirty and you have to do things for them. And therefore, whether they call me Prof Doris, Doris, Young, whatever they call me at the end of the day, the respect, Ashok, is their culture, is the respect. No matter what I say, call me Doris. Some people still prefer to call me Prof Doris. And it's okay. That's all right. So I want to end by saying, yes, the world is a sandwich. But it's a gourmet sandwich and it's getting better. And I just hope that we will be able to do the job well. Uh, it's challenging, but it's rewarding. And I want more females to put their hands up and to take on leadership and do it your way. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Doris. I think, you know, these comments that you've discussed with us previously to this meeting, and then also that you just laid out right now about this, the, the, you know, you summarize this succinctly as being a sandwich job where, you know, you fit into the context where there, there are people that report to you, but then you're also reporting to other people. And I think that's something, certainly uh, as I've gone through my career, you know, I, I definitely thought uh, many years ago that yes, the HOD 
should be the boss, can just do whatever they want, right? And I think, you know, um, hopefully uh, everybody else in the audience as well, uh, certainly Melina and I have seen, you know, in uh, having a chance to interact with uh, the HOD panel that we have here today, really I'd like to sort of thank them, first of all, for putting a human perspective and, and giving us their different perspectives on what the job is like being a leader uh, at this level um, in the university. A second thing I wanna uh, touch on is there are a bunch of parallels that, you know, I, again, as a, as a you know, much more junior person to, to the HOD position here, as a, but yet as a faculty member, we see this uh, as you gain seniority, right? That there are parallels uh, I try to maintain the culture in my lab, but then that culture is influenced by what's going on in the department. And I think for the HOD uh, position, this is something that we've heard that trying to be able to influence culture in the department has to occur in the context of the university. And then certainly at the university level, you know, this was touched on by, um, by Paul uh, that, you know, that exists within the bounds of society as well. And there's culture there that's influencing. So I want to pick up on this this last um, item here, and that's really culture. And let's maybe just sort of focus this in. Uh, and I think, you know, uh, we'll, I, I'm gonna turn it over to Ashok for the first comments, but the, the question would be, you know, how, if, if we just sort of focus on as an HOD, how is culture generated in the department or how do you see that being generated in the department? And how do you think about, right? When you want to go about and actively change culture in a way that, you know, you, you think that uh, would benefit the, the department. And, and I, I, I do want to acknowledge and thank you for bringing this up that you already did a slight culture change within this meeting already. And I'm going to call you a shock and <laughs> you know, hopefully we can all do this. And, and oh, you know, absolutely. as a microcosm of, of changing behavior here, we're all going to pitch in and, and contribute to this. You so know, uh, let's let's talk about culture. Uh, Ashok, over to you. So, um, Swaina, you ask a great question. It's also a complex question. So um, I'll try to focus on a few issues because, of course, it's a very wide-ranging point. So um, culture is often built up over time. Um, and it's part of a trajectory. And a trajectory has a past as well as a future. And so what you need to do to change that culture is to ask yourself, what is the vision for change? Communicate that vision for change while at the same time grounding oneself in what is the present, which is obviously the result of, uh, you know, often years of uh, particular practice. So it goes back really to what I said um, in my brief uh, talk, which is um, heads of departments and other people in positions of influence have a major role to play because we can help at a level beyond individual relationships to help to define and change the norms that basically are, are what establish a particular culture. Um, and I alluded to some of the things that I feel are really important, representation, for example, ensuring that younger faculty, people with diverse viewpoints, uh, women are appropriately represented in governance structures. Um, I think um, Latsala mentioned that many of the younger faculty are hungry um, for uh, participation, for expanding. How can we group the next generation of leaders and ensure that change is durable? Anything that you know, we introduce within our brief lifespan as heads of departments or in positions of influence. Um, it means actually inculcating these types of agendas into the next generation. Transparency, I find, is extremely important. And that was my experience in Cambridge, as well as my very recent experience here. If there is a culture in which decisions are taken without appropriate consultation, without people's ability to voice their views, without acknowledgement of those views, and even if the ultimate decision doesn't please everybody, at least everybody feels that they, they have a stake in the process, they've participated. And finally, of course, communication. And I think communication is at the bottom of a lot of this. Um, how does one communicate with people? Um, as uh, Doris just said, you know, um, look, we're all, there should not be so much of a hierarchy. And again, this is alluding to what Paul said in communication, we need to talk to people as equals with important points of view. Uh, not all points of view will be relevant, appropriate, but we need to hear them, challenge them where necessary. So I think all of these are part of changing a culture. Not easy, 
but I think this is the way to do it. Great, thank you, Ashok. And actually, we want to just sort of open this up. Uh, you know, if any of the other panel members feel free to jump in, just as Ashok did, <laughs> to change the culture with with the addresses. So, uh, it, it, do do we have any other reactions, or you know, does anyone else uh, in the panel want to comment on sort of generating culture or, or other aspects of how you might try to change culture within your own department? I may just want to add a couple of statements on that, uh, Swain. So I appreciate. Uh, Ashok and, and Doris's comments and Paul's comments about um, hierarchy. But I think among the most important aspects of leadership, which is no different whether you're a woman or a man leader, is the ability to listen wherever and whichever role you play. I think it applies for the sandwich model as well. We need to listen up and to listen down. And I think this is the first aspect of any leadership. The second aspect, I mean, I think that applies whether you're a woman or a man as a leader and whether you're a woman who wishes to be a leader or a man who wishes to be a leader. The second aspect I think that we often forget is respect is not in title alone. Respect is in every aspect of behavior. And I think we often forget that. And, um, and I think that needs to be inculcated in everyone. Uh, whichever direction you're looking at. The third aspect about equity, I think, is always about power. I know that, um, that as individuals, uh, we think that a head has power, but I'm gonna say probably not. We are empowered by our peers and the people who work with us, and they're not working for us. And I think this is a differentiation that I often make. And as a lead, I mean, as a head, I think my door is always open for everyone who wants to meet me. Of course, during COVID times, often this is during um, on a Zoom conversation. But having said that, keeping your door open. And I think these are fundamental aspects of leadership. But on the other hand, I really want to highlight that as a, as a HOD, we do have KPIs. And it is often the case how we balance this, you know, how do we balance individual needs versus the division or the department's needs? And I think this is where the head needs to bring his or her entire team along with her and being able to inspire, bringing them along um, on our journey together. And at the same time, aiming for at least a certain level of harmony. I think these are some of the the key characteristics that will guide us along as we pursue our own journey. And I don't know whether I've been succinct enough in, in, um, in highlighting this dilemma that we face as leaders, because yes, we want to be the best department of medicine in the world or the best department of family medicine in the world, but that requires everybody to pull their weight. So how do you convince everybody to pull their weight and move along and not leave anybody behind? And I think this is where I think we need to take the best skills in managing individuals as well as managing ourselves to bring our whole agenda forward as leaders. And I think this is the challenge that we face at an individual and as a, as a, as a corporate level. Thank you. Thank you, Vatsala. Um, I was going to ask um, a question or at least put it out there. Um, earlier on, it was mentioned, I believe it was Doris who spoke about trickling information down and also um, either the values or strategic direction or budget cuts. How do you have any concrete examples the other way around where you've listened and heard what the ground ones or at least have a fair idea of common things that would actually need to be changed? Listen down and filter up and make either policy changes or um, directional changes or even uh, changes in cultural norms that were raised earlier on. Uh, if any of you have any specific or concrete examples to give? Maybe I'll, I will um, answer that first. Um, the policy. So the EOCD, your committee, uh, WISE, Women in Science and Healthcare, uh, equal opportunity and your assistant dean with, uh, uh, with Yun. So when, when the committee set up a policy based on a lot of work that you all have been doing, 
So that policy goes up to the dean or to NUS, and it should filter down to the head of department. And we need to, we need to operationalize, we need to implement it. For example, that when you have a committee uh, consisted of one gender, a committee is all men or a committee is all women, you have to send the policy is that you have to make sure that the other equal numbers or some of the voices that are required, uh, administrator has to be part of it, not all just uh, doctors, other discipline has to, has to come in. So we have to operationalize the policy and there has to be a cycle of reporting. So once you have done it, we have to be our KPI. You know, what percentage of women or percentage of other allied health or uh, administrative staff is on your department committee, on your executive committee? Is it just all same group talking about the same thing? So the concrete example, when you have a policy, it's great, but you also have to close the loop. They also have to become a KPI so that it, it makes us do it because there's so many tasks of the head of department. You know, we, get the, we have to get the uh, five out of five for teaching, uh, research on, you know, we're debating on the, the impact factor, but we never had that reporting on, have you had committee members in your group, in your department? There are diversity, there is a culture, there is a norm, just not lip service. I, I've gone, gone through so much of my career is paying lip service, no teeth. That's why the meat in the sandwich, the health department, must operationalize it and then get the feedback and report back. And I think the only have the way we close the cycle loop, otherwise we just be talking forever and no nothing, no outcomes. Okay, I wanna sort of at least give uh, other people a chance if they wanna share reactions to this. Okay, and if not, you know, I want to pick up, you know, there's a lot of things uh, that just coming from the different, different perspectives, we're, I think, hitting a lot of the same issues. But um, this idea about KPIs, uh, and, you know, I want to pick up on this, uh, especially in the context of, you know, we've heard multiple times from different people about we have diversity uh, among the people that, you know, in HOD, uh, there's just diversity within the department and success may look different for different people. And how does that mate with, you know, do, does the system of KPIs that we have, the system of KPIs that as a HOD, you know, those are what you're put onto to achieve, right? How does that interface with when people need, you know, like have different goals and aspirations? And maybe, you know, just a somewhat randomly arrow somebody here, Reshma, maybe you want to comment on that, like the interface between KPIs and, and trying to individualize mentorship and, and career progression. So yeah, thanks, Wayne. Um, I think the most important is communicating um, so that people understand what uh, the department KPIs are. And I think quite often, while there are individual needs, when people understand what the department goals and objectives are, they typically step up. So it's not been as difficult. I think the key is ensuring that people understand where the department is headed, that vision and that clarity. I think that has to be articulated. And if one does it often enough and be completely transparent about things that uh, the department is going to be held up to, uh, generally, the interface has not been as challenging. But I just want to add a little bit to what the previous discussion was um, about, which is essentially as an HOD, uh, raising awareness. And um, so, so at the time uh, when I think just about four or five years ago, I was seeing a lot of seminar um, and conference notices. And I used to notice that it was almost all only male speakers. And just raising that awareness in the department that there should be inclusion or in other committees, that there should be an inclusion of at least 30% women speakers, I think that had made a difference. So sometimes it's not that people don't want to include um, women, it's just that they may not have thought the people that came to mind as potential speakers were men. So it's not exclusion but raising awareness that there should be inclusion has been important in changing how conferences are now conducted. So I think as HODs, we are entrusted with a lot of responsibility 
and we can use it to raise awareness at different levels and then um, perhaps have a change in policy as well. Okay, so we're always giving a chance for others to feel free to jump in if you if you have any uh, other comments you want to add to this. But really, I think, um, you know, hopefully, uh, as an audience, and again, feel free to put any comments or, you know, there's already an active chat going on, feel free to put any comments or questions in there. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I want to loop back and, you know, again, a lot of these are intertwined issues. And, and I want to loop back on, on something that you know, Paul uh, mentioned very strongly about, you know, that hierarchy, uh, you know, there's good reasons for it, there's good aspects to it, but then uh, there's times when we kind of want to eliminate hierarchy, um, especially uh, in terms of uh, in a scientific community. Um, and so, you know, I, I want to just, uh, you know, let's be, be clear, we've actually, you know, as Ashok mentioned, we use these titles. And so we can try to get rid of these. And actually, in the language that has been throughout this webinar, we we are talking. You know, we, we do have HODs here, and there is a reporting structure. There is a clear hierarchy and an organization chart within the university. And we have used words like listening down, managing up. Uh, and, you know, like the, these words are there, right? And so maybe uh, I can sort of uh, just uh, raise this issue with Paul. Like how, you know. Hierarchy is not necessarily a bad thing. It, it, um, you know, like well, uh, I, I don't think I was arguing to eliminate it, Swain, um, because I, I don't think that's realistic. But I, I definitely think that, that, that you can put structures in place where, where you democratize and sort of loosen the process. And at, at the end of the day, it's it's about essentially creating a, a conducive work work environment where. Um, the kind of competent competences that I mentioned earlier, you know, things like empathy, sharing credit, um, types of, of, sort of leadership behaviors um, where, where, where women generally score higher than men. Um, if you can create an environment where these things are basically recognized and encouraged, then just by a process of natural selection, we are going to get more female leadership. Um, and, and this becomes really important for subjects um, such as appointments and promotion and tenure and so on. Um, because I think what most people kind of recognize when they're selecting candidates, and this is maybe choosing someone for promotion or choosing to appoint another individual, we all have natural biases. And you may think of yourself as a person that's basically um, um, sort of gender indifferent, um, that's com that bases all of their decision making based on, on pure merit, uh, merit uh, pure merit and, and, and meritocracy. But the reality is that every person instinctively wants to appoint and promote people like themselves, because it's much easier to recognise someone's qualities when they're, they're they're qualities that you see in yourself. Right, it's much easier to recognize that when it's someone that, that has a very, very sort of different outlook on things. So, so what this means in practice is you can, and you, you can implement policies that will try and, and improve um, the, 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 the female contribution in things like promotion and tenure committees and so on. And, and these will have an impact, but where you can see really profound differences over time is, is, is what we've been saying earlier. It's all about changing the culture and, and basically changing the way we think about leadership and management within our organization. Thank you very much, Paul. I was going to ask a question about, because you talked about equity, uh, flattening hierarchies and uh, where the same people do the same things with the, their kindred, their same types. The much maligned uh, old boys club that is often used, I was going to bring that up and ask you what you think could be done to change that perspective and to change um, in reality rather than having you know, visions that are great, but not actually translated into reality. 
what could be done to um, have a more inclusive, um, not really club, but then, you know, everyone belongs to the club. Everyone takes part in decisions and governance. Maybe I should tackle this first. This is a very daring question. You raised the word all boys club. And I look at this screen and, and I have to say, it, is, it exists, it exists in Australia, white boys club or from private school. It, it exists because you, you appoint people who are like you. You play footy together, you go to do things together, you go to the same school together, what do we expect? But it exists, first of all, acknowledge it exists, but put it aside. Do you want all girls club? Mm, maybe, maybe not. Put it aside. Then you yourself as head of department or your own career goal, every role model, Masala. And I couldn't be more a standing out woman, Chinese in Australia. You know, the all boys club I lived with, I fought, I saw it happening. I zip my lips. Because you say something, you become aggressive. You become attack. You use the race card. You use the feminine card. Don't do use that card. Use your ability. Use the way you're good at. Be bold. You know you're just as smart. Don't be afraid to speak up. You bring the people along, especially both male and female. Bring them together and bring change together. Bring some of the boys. Bring some of the girls. Bring some who are mixed. We do it together with a common purpose. Only then do we don't have this hierarchy Thank you. What a challenge, what a daring question to ask. Uh, and I apologize if there's all boys club, but there's all girls club too. And it's just as bad. And in the end of the day, it's about what we achieve outcomes and you know, what we do it together. You know, that is why KPI opportunity, uh, make sure that we are gender balanced, make sure promotion committee must be represented by some women, even observing. You know, if you're all professors, only professors, full professors can be on the appointment committee. It's so hard to find full professors to go on a selection committee. Well, why is it so difficult to do that? Why does it have to be? That means I can't even get enough women to be on my selection committee. No, observer. I have to stop here because I think it can be done. It can be done. It takes all of us to do it together. Doris is you know, really important points. And if I can just chip in, um, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I spent um, 25 years in Cambridge, which is full of clubs of all kinds, all boys <laughs> clubs, college clubs, what have you. <laughs> but the point is that transparency can shed a light into decision-making and can act against vested interests. And so I would argue that inculcating transparency as part of the working process in decision making and in the implementation of decisions is a good way to do what Doris was saying, which is to fight clubs, whether old boys clubs or women's clubs or what have you. You are shocking, Doris. Yes, I think clubs of any sort are, are not very helpful. Um, it may, may not be gender based, but inclusion in the forms of ethnic diversity as well, um, people with uh, disabilities, greater or smaller disabilities, without having to actually come up with very strict quotas, because that also puts a dampener on things when people have to work within percentages. But to be inclusive and to recognize, um, to value the work that's put in, the intelligence, the empathy, the kindness, and I think that sort of inclusivity, rather than a gender-based one, is, is what we're looking at um, when we sort of manage up, manage across, and manage down. Um, over to you, Sui. Okay, so I think we're running a little bit short of time here, uh, and I, I really want to thank everybody who's contributed to the chat. There's been a, an active sort of commentary that's been going on there. I don't see any uh, specific questions in there. So what we're going to do is we're going to start to wrap up here. And um, what I'd like to do is maybe, uh, again, give the spotlight uh, to each of our HOV um, panel members here one at a time. And you know, what I'd like to do is you know maybe just uh, 
uh, in, in keeping with the themes of transparency and communication. And I think there's, this is where a lot of the interface happens, you know, the idea that the HOD can just sort of control everything because they're the boss and they can do, they've got the budget and they, they can just do anything, but like really opening up that communication so you get that perspective. So the question here is going to be if here's your chance, right? So we've got, um, looks like we've got 80 people uh, uh, aside from the just 80 attendees here. Uh, and, you know, what would you want to say, right? And it could be something maybe as simple as just don't call me prof. <laughs> call me by my first, you know, something along these lines. If you had a chance to, to make one shout out to, you know, what would you like to see change or what's one big challenge? Uh, and so uh, we're going to take the same order as, as we had before. So maybe uh, Ashok, you want to start off? Sure. I'm, I'm, I've already voiced my view on titles and I'm trying to uh, implement that. But the other big challenge I have is that because of the culture, people still don't freely communicate what they really think. And obviously there are situations in which one has to moderate one's views, one has to sort of express things in a respectful manner. But nevertheless, people just don't say what they think. And it's taken some time to get to the bottom of this and to challenge this and to get people to really say, look, even if you have to come to my office, tell me what you really think. I don't mind, I want to hear that because it makes my decision making that much more effective. Okay, great, thank you. And Vasala? Uh, if there's one message that I want to disseminate, I think we need to allow each woman to pursue her individual choice. And I think there's a subtle pressure, even in this WISH symposium, that we expect the same aspirations of every woman. I, I think that's a very subtle pressure that I think is felt on the ground. So. I would like to appeal to we as leaders, women or otherwise, let's listen to what each one of our women peers or others who work with us want to do. If they want to pursue one direction at this point in time, let them pursue it. There is time to postpone one aspect of one's career or what there may be other pressures that they're going through at that point in time with a biological clock and all these other issues. So I would like to appeal that we as leaders understand that aspirations are different and to allow each woman to pursue the choice that she wishes to do. And I think we should be enabling that rather than putting numbers and KPIs that you must achieve this goal at this point in time. So I vote for individuality and to enable individual aspirations to be achieved. Thank you. Thank you, Vasala. Um, there is no one prescribed way of doing leadership or um, progressing in our careers. As you say, each one can choose, each one has the ability to make those important decisions for themselves and that should be respected. Thank you. Um, Reshma. What would you like to add um, as a takeaway message for all of us? I, the challenge that I felt um, and being HOD is that the realization that it's a very instruction-based system and I want to decentralize power and decision-making to delegate and let people feel empowered. This I think will promote ownership and engagement and I hope that this approach of decentralizing power will allow women leaders to come up, uh, to be in positions where they contribute. And that is uh, going to Vatsila's point if they wish to. But essentially when they are part of the decision-making process, they will naturally grow into leadership positions as well. So that's the message that I would like to convey that don't be afraid of decision making and taking ownership of what you do. Thank you, Reshma. You mentioned earlier on that you've been in your role for about a year. Uh, thank you for, you know, joining us and sharing with us all that you've managed to do in a year. That's great. Um, thank you for having me. Paul, um, apart from hierarchy, are there any other um, topics that you would like to 
um, emphasize in, in, in a few words? No, I mean, I think I've, I've enjoyed the discussion today. I would say that most of the other issues that, that you know, I'd like to sort of discuss have already been covered. Um, just as a, a final point, I mean, essentially, I, I think I would encourage every single lab head, every program leader, every department head, to think about the type of leader that they want to be and, and think about how they are perceived by the individuals um, that they're responsible for. And, and basically don't focus too much on what, what you might call the more masculine um, um, forms of leadership. You know, assertiveness is important, tough decision-making is important, but equally as important are things like empathy and, and, and teamwork and sharing credit and all of these things. Um, so that, that's the final point I would make. Okay, thank you very much, Paul. And then uh, we'll turn it over to Doris for last comments. Um, I, I just think uh, a few words is that to be a head of department um, is a privilege. You earn it for my female colleagues. Don't be afraid to take up heads of department role. Always say that you've earned it and you want to lead and you lead by example, you lead fairly, you will be influential, you will be bold, you will speak up and you always praise your staff. It is not all about you. You get there already. You don't need to be professor, professor. Be generous and you bring all the other up with you. A head of department is judged on what you have built. It's not what you have achieved in the sort of PI, F, WCI, et cetera, and compete. So it's very important that the message is about the word is influential. So being the sandwich, influence, influential above, manage up, and influence your team below so that you lead together and you become the interpreter. You facilitate, and that's why I call myself the sandwich. On the subject I'm for a sandwich. On the subject of sandwiches, uh, I hope everyone you know is looking forward to lunch if you've not had lunch after this. <laughs> <laughs> Your stomachs must be growling if you've not. Um, but we're I, not I, looking to have the HODs eaten alive. <laughs> I um, especially enjoyed preparing this um, meeting with all of you when we had the um, session prior to this. Um, much more for its candor and your willingness to share um, straight from the heart. I think this has in itself uh, been a cultural norm change because most times we say what needs to, or we want, we think people want to hear and the prescribed or correct things to say. But when we say things that speak from our heart and we hope that they will make impactful changes. Um, that that is something you know I, I value, and I thank you all for being so candid and um, professional in in your HOD ship. Um, over to you, Swain. Okay, so we're just a little bit over time, although we started a few minutes late. So uh, we're going to have to unfortunately close this session. I really want to echo Melina's comments that. Uh, it was really a lot of fun and very, very educational to get the different perspectives uh, from, from all the uh, HODs here that we have on our panel um, as we're preparing for this and, and sort of hearing what their challenges were and really putting that human perspective. You know, it, it, they've got um, things that they're worried about and, and things that they're trying to balance as well. Uh, and I think, you know, um, uh, hopefully uh, the, this is something that you were able to take away. And I, I really like how Doris put it, even despite the challenges, it's still privileged uh, to be in the positions that we are, uh, wherever you are and, and you know, sort of a, in the hierarchy, however flat it may be. Okay, so uh, with that, it leads me to, um, once again, thank all of our panel members here today. I wanna thank Melina for joining me here to, to help facilitate this session. And uh, thank you to the Equal Opportunities and Career Development uh, Office, as well as the Women in Science and Healthcare um, Committee uh, from NUHS uh, for organizing this lunch and learn. And please look out for information for the next one that's coming up. Okay, thank you very much for attending.
Thank you, everyone. Thank you.